man, today is such an interesting day. I feel oddly relaxed. I don't know if anyone else feels that way. It's just like, yeah, this is a really chill, cool kind of day. So if I'm a little bit like, that seems, that seems like tipsy. No, if I'm like a little bit relaxed, not, not anything else, uh, I just feel really relaxed. It feels great. You guys feel good? I feel good. Let's pray. Yeah, thanks for that. All right. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for just another wonderful opportunity to gather together as your people and stand in your presence. And Father, just be transformed by you as we look upon you, as we spend time in your presence and your community with your people. God, the amazing things you are doing in our lives. And we thank you for that. And we just um, give us open ears and open hearts to what you have for us, not the things that I say, Lord, but the truths that you want to communicate to us this morning and to carry with us for the rest of this week and maybe even the rest of our lives. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Everyone says, amen, amen. Yeah, uh, so recently, and about two weeks ago, I discovered, uh, this, this may be a shock to some of you, but I had discovered that I have more patience than the average 6 to 12-year-old child. Uh, you may not think it's very impressive because it's not, but I did it. So I, I, two weeks ago, we had our Vacation Bible School at VBS, and I was in charge of facilitating the games, which I think is really funny because if you know me, I'm actually a really boring guy. Uh, but, but I like to talk. I just I don't like to play games. But anyways, I facilitated this. Someone say amen. <laughs> Someone amen that? Okay. Yeah, so I facilitated the games. Uh, and I, I've done things like that before. I wanted the kids to have fun. You wanted your kids to have fun. They wanted to have fun. I had fun games planned and all that kind of stuff. But without fail, at the start of every single rotation, the kids would just start running over. So we did games right out in the field, and they would just come running from in, in out here with, you know, way past their leaders. Their leaders are, like, way in the behind. Like, they don't even know what their kids are doing anymore. They're taking care of, don't worry. But, like, they're just, like, bolting in, and they immediately just start picking up and touching and moving all the things that I have set up for their games. They're picking out the pool noodles, and they're just kicking the inflatable balls and like I've got like hula hoops and other stuff and like lines on the ground they're like what's this you know like they're just messing with everything and so they're messing around and they're talking with each other and it's really difficult to start you know explaining the games and whatnot so now I realize that kids are gone and back so they don't have to hear this and and know that some of you are parents of these kids so the kids weren't bad per se right they're they're just they're just fun curious energetic kids not bad but uh, uh, they were not paying attention so that I couldn't explain the game that we were going to play. And so what I started to do was I just started to outweigh them. I was like, I want to have fun. You want to have fun. But fun is going to be this. And if you're not interested, I, I can wait. I can wait 20 minutes because that's how long that, that we had. And so I would just sit there and I'd be like, hey, don't touch that. Hey, please put that down. Hey, you know, like pay attention and just wait and wait. And wait, you know, some groups wouldn't, wouldn't, it was just funny, it was just great. I, so I had, point being is, I could outweigh the children. Uh, I was, I was impressed with myself. I went home and bragged to my wife about that. So I would start to wait until they would start to listen, and eventually, you know, of course they would. I wanted them to have fun. They also wanted to have fun. And if I, you know, sat all the kids down and I said, hey, here's your options. You want boredom or do you want to have fun? They're going to be like, yeah, I want to have fun, right? Like that's just what they're going to say. But even though they wanted fun, many of their actions worked against their opportunities for fun. Fun wasn't just doing whatever they wanted. Fun was aligning with the VBS plan for fun. Isn't it funny how often our actions don't line up with what we say we want? You thought I was making fun of your kids. No, uh, isn't it funny how often our actions, uh, they, don't, they don't quite match when we say, I, I want this, but the things you do don't produce that. I want to be rich, but I don't want to work hard. I don't want to budget. I like to spend money. Let me know that's going to be a problem, unless you marry someone rich. Um, <laughs> I want to be healthy, but I don't eat vegetables and I don't physically move. 
Uh, I want to be smart, but I don't like to study. Hmm, how does that work? You know, I want to be godly, but I'm not going to show up at church. I'm not going to read the Bible. I'm not going to pray. I mean, you, you get the point. I want to be funny. I want to be likable. I'm going to be courageous or organized. Whatever these things that we have, we say that we want, but our actions can say otherwise. Sometimes this is because we need a clarity and direction. We need a little bit of clarity and direction. We say we want something, but we don't really know what that something is or what that something is going to cost us. So I think it's been, yeah, it's been, oh, it's been given away this entire time. Uh, today, <laughs> surprise, we're talking about Proverbs. We're continuing our series, the book of Proverbs, The Extraordinary Ordinary, where we are exploring different key themes throughout the book of Proverbs. And can you guess what today's theme is? Yeah, life and death. I can't even trick you. So today we're going to talk about life and death. We're going to explore that. Now imagine, if you will, actually you don't have to imagine, it's on the next slide. But I present before you two boxes. One box says life. The other box says death, right? And I say, hey, choose today which box is going to be yours, but please choose life, right? And you're like, this is... This is kind of weird. It's kind of ridiculous. Why are you, how depressed do you think I am? Like, of course, I'm going to pick life. Life is the obvious choice. It's the right choice. It's the good choice. And as ridiculous as sort of that scenario would be, this is what God presents us with every single day. The choice between life and death. And believe it or not, I would be willing to argue that we all too often choose death. If presented, we say, yeah, I want life. But our actions betray our choices. We can't pick life, yet continue to live in a way that produces death. Now, it's probably unintentional. We're not deliberately being like, ah, oh, I'm choosing death every day. Yeah, ha, you know, right? Like, I hope not. Uh, if you do, <laughs> there, my wife is a therapist, and we can... We can get you help in a, in a good way. It sounds like a joke, but I, it is a joke, but I, I do care. <laughs> in order to choose life, we need to know what life is. More specifically, we need to understand what the Bible tells us about life and death. What does it mean to be alive? In English, there are several nuances to this word. Uh, when we say, uh, you know, I'm alive, we can mean I categorize three different things. There's probably more, but I just got three for the sake of, of this. Three is a good number. God likes it, too. Um, we have existence, energy, and experiencing. That's, that's kind of the way that I, I find that we use the English word of life. Existence is obvious. It's sucking air, beating heart, flailing arms, brain activity for some. You, you exist. You're alive. It's, it, you, you, this would be used when you say things like, you know, when does life begin? Or if you've recently escaped a bear, you would say, I'm alive. And you don't mean like, oh, this feels great. I mean, unless you're like an adrenaline junkie. And again, we can get you help. Uh, but there's also energy, excitement, passion, vigor, vitality. Uh, used when you say things like, I'm full of life, or this church is full of life, or this party is, you get the point. And then there's experiencing things, and these are things such as desires or the quality of life. It's used in phrases like, life is not measured by the number of breaths we take, but by the moments that take your breath away. Yeah, deep, profound. Uh, it's the answer to things that make you come alive. Uh, it's what you would say means to really live, right? Adventure or pleasure or purpose or making memories. Perhaps you'd say something like, I want a quiet life. You know, that's a quality, that's a state. Or maybe someone says to you, you need to get a life. Same idea. <laughs> so those are the ways that we can use the word life. Now in Proverbs, it presents a vision for life. Now if you remember from... Uh, I don't remember when I last spoke, but I talked about the fool, and I presented the idea of the moral logic of Proverbs. And just to remind you, the moral logic of Proverbs states that honoring God leads to success and peace, but rejecting and ignoring God, ignoring and rejecting God leads to ruin and shame. Now, the vision of life follows along with this same logic. It's just in the same package. Honoring God is the way of life. But to reject and ignore God 
is the realm of death. See, life is more than just existence, energy, and experiencing. The essence of life is intermingled and interwoven with relationship and obedience with God. Death in Proverbs and death throughout the Bible does at times mean to literally die. Yet death is understood as a whole realm in conflict with life. So rather than a single, merely physical event. So death is not just the cessation of a beating heart, brain activity, your arms stop flailing. It's everything that is opposite to life. The way of life is relationship with and obedience to God. Anything else is the realm of death. This means that our daily choices to pick death are not limited to just risky behaviors or choices with bad consequences. It is also ignoring, ignoring or rejecting God and his ways. The irony is that you can be living your best life while continually choosing death. So with that in mind, Let's continue to explore how Proverbs speaks about life. Just like English, Proverbs also utilizes sort of the nuances of the word. Uh, it's very similar, but it's helpful to know when you, when you run across it. It's like, oh, this is what it could be. There are three facets, just like the English one that I'm going to point out. Recognizing, of course, these categories are a bit narrow, a bit arbitrary because the word is more robust. And so one of the one, you know, all three could be true of a, of a particular, of the word life, yet, you know, depending on context, you can say, oh, it's probably this one, which is how context works. Three facets for the word of life used in Proverbs. The first, and just like English, is the idea of existence, right? Like sucking air, beating heart, flailing arms, brain activity. Proverbs 3, 1 through 2, it says this, My son, do not forget my teaching. But let your heart keep my commands. For the length of your days and years of your life and peace will be added unto you. 4.10. Hear my son and accept my words. The years of your life may be many. 9.10-11. through 11, The fear of the Lord is beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is insight. For by me your days have been multiplied and years will be added to your life. So catch the common theme here. Years are being added to your life. The, the, under, the context makes it pretty clear. This is about time alive, in the most literal sense. Proverbs is saying that living a life that is honoring to God goes with the grain of the universe, with that, that moral logic that it talks about, and it stacks your favor for longevity. To live in submission to God is helpful for a prolonged existence on this side of eternity. Like it's, yeah, you live longer, you make less people upset at you, so your neighbor doesn't kill you. Because that would, that would end your life. All right, second is quality, right? Proverbs 3, 21 through 22 says, My son, do not lose sight of these. Keep sound wisdom and discretion, and they will be life for your soul and adornment for your neck. Life for your soul is, is more literally uh, translated life for your life. And this life for your life is being paralleled with something that is to adorn your neck. This life for your life is something that can be seen. It's a quality that upon a person, like fine jewelry. Proverbs 13, 12. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but desired fulfilled is a tree of life. A tranquil heart gives life to the flesh, but envy makes the bone rot. Life is here a state of being, personal benefits, emotional and mental well-being. 15, 4. A gentle tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. This is more about how you interact with others, your social standings. 1615, in the light of the king's face, there's life, and his favor is like the clouds that bring spring rain. Life is, again, social favor and status. So it means more than just existence, and, uh, but it's also quality. Life is also the quality and the material and the physical, the relational, emotional, and mental benefits. Proverbs is saying that honoring God going with the grain of the universe, following upon that moral logic. It stacks your favor for a better quality in life, physical, emotional, mental, and relational areas. 
To live in submission to God tends to be best for your personal and relational well-being. The third category, and most important, is called the way of God. And here is where scripture begins to actually expand upon our understanding of life. This is where it all actually comes together. Proverbs 10, 16 through 17 says, The wages of righteousness leads to life, the gain of the wicked to sin. Whoever heeds instruction is on the path of life, but who rejects reproof leads others astray. Now, it's easy to look at this and say life and think of it as like mortality or quality. But it says the righteous get life. And what the, what the comparison is that the wicked get, well, it's not death, right? It's sin. Sin being that thing that separates us from God. It's pointing to a life in alignment to God versus one that is not. And it says to heed the instructions is to be upon this path of light. And to reject it is not physical death. It's not a loss of quality of life, but it's actually leading people astray, leading people off of this. It speaks to a relational nature specifically with God. Proverbs 9, 6. Leave your simple way and live and walk in the way of insight. If you remember, or if you weren't, well, I'll explain it now. But if you remember from the fool uh, sermon, the simple is the naive fool. But it is one who doesn't acknowledge this moral logic that to honor God leads to success and to reject him leads to shame and ruin. So those who live against the grain of this universe, they are being pleaded by, uh, with, with, uh, by wisdom to leave this ignorance and choose a life that honors God. This life is the way of life. The honoring God is to find life. They're already alive. You can't be like, you know, stop being simple and live. They're alive. What they're seeking is something else, and it's saying come into alignment with this moral logic, which is to come into alignment with your relationship with God. 8, 35, 36, whoever finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. But he who fails to find me injures himself. All who hate me love death. The me here is Lady Wisdom speaking. And she's being compared to say, if you find me, you find life. And then the parallel is, life is favor from the Lord. Wisdom is honoring God. And it brings you into, well, favor is not just like blessings from God. It's that relational aspect you have, the right standing with God, to clarify. And so this wisdom brings honoring, uh, wisdom is honoring God. And so relationship with an obedience to God equals life. The category of life is actually a right-standing relationship with God. To reject and ignore God is only hurting yourself and embracing that life of death. So life in Proverbs is about existence and quality, but most importantly, it speaks to this idea of the way of life. And this way of life is relationship with and obedience to God. Anything else is this realm of death. You might be thinking, well, what about all the good people who do good things that aren't specifically, you know, doing it for God or know God and all that kind of stuff? Do they all exist in the realm of death? That seems kind of harsh. And, uh, well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the answer is yes. Because I'm not saying that people are doing bad things. Right? They can be doing good things and they'd be good people, but they're still not on the way of life because you cannot separate life from God. Two people can do the same thing, but one will be on the way of life and the other is in the realm of death. And this is all where the action flows from. And this may seem a bit extreme, but at the same time, there is an incredible generosity from God in this. And I'll explain that. But first, the greatest good that you do apart from God, has zero eternal significance. Even the best of our best, the most righteous thing you can do, the Bible talks about that in Isaiah, as filthy rags, right? The best quality that we can bring, it has zero eternal significance without God, right? If you, if you did something without God, I feel like you should put it on YouTube and at least you'll get some likes out of it. And that's your reward. You've, you've gotten your reward. Yet, on the flip side, the smallest Thing done out of relationship and obedience with God carries eternal significance and reward. Like, that's absolutely ridiculous. It's like, it's, it's so polarizing. The best that you can try in your own efforts is worthless eternally. Yet, 
in Jesus, like the smallest thing you do has significance, eternal significance. It's like, okay, you know, it talks about giving a cup of cold water. It's like, hey, I just gave a kid, a little kid, one of your kids, who wasn't paying attention during games, just gave him a cup of water because he said, I'm thirsty, and I'm not a monster, right? <laughs> gave him a cup of water, and also, you know, I love God, and I, and I love others. And it's like God is saying to us, hey, what you did for them, it's as if you did it to Jesus himself. And I'm going to remember that forever, but you, the kindness you did, and I'm going to reward you for that. You're like, it was a cup of water. I didn't even, like, make the water myself. I pressed a button. Like, you know, it was, it's, it's incredible what he says, what he wants to reward and acknowledge that we do the moment you're on this path of life. It's a whiplashing switch outside of God. Nothing we do carries eternal significance, yet with God, even the smallest things have eternal value. It's bonkers. I like that word. I don't use that until I'm preaching. It's my preaching word. This is the difference between the way of life and the realm of death. Anyone can do good things and be a good person, but without God, it all exists within this realm of death. And it all hinges upon relationship and obedience with God. The way of life is this relationship with and obedience to God. Anything else is the realm of death. In the ancient world, there is no division between sacred and secular. If you study, you know, sort of the ancient cultures and ancient Israel, that kind of stuff. There's no such thing as an atheist in the ancient world. Life is to relate to the divine. The understanding was that people, we all were made by and made for the gods. Everyone served some gods, uh, and this was intrinsically interwoven into everything that they did. A lot of this is because your survival depended, at least how you understood, your survival depended on whether or not your gods were pleased with you. Okay? So today, we think we know better. Well, we do know a little bit better. In our modern sensibilities, our science, and our naturalism, we have new categories for understanding reality. The Western mindset can see these ancient people as kind of crazy. We know why it rains or why it doesn't rain. I had a kid ask me at VVS, actually. He's like, why is it raining? And I just thought I would be clever. And I was like, well, that's because the ocean's water evaporates. And he started doing that. And he just totally just didn't care anymore. And I was like, that's a great way to answer kids. You just bore them. All right. We know why it rains. We know why it doesn't rain. We know why volcanoes erupt and earthquake happen. We know what a solar eclipse is, and it doesn't freak most of us out. <laughs> right? We no longer need to serve any gods. Life can be understood apart from any deity, supernatural being, or higher power. But the reality is, as the Bible teaches us, that humanity was created to worship. We were made as image bearers, Genesis 127, which means that our created purpose is to model, represent, and reflect God. Our free choice is not whether or not we reflect, but who we reflect. We're like mirrors. A mirror doesn't choose to stop being a mirror. It's where it's directed. I guess mirrors don't have that choice, though. Every analogy breaks down at some point. Everyone still serves a God, and it's intrinsically interwoven into everything that we do. The difference is that we call our gods by different names. In the Bible, it's Molech. Chemosh, Baal, or Baal in Hebrew. Ooh, it's so good. <laughs> Today we have money, power, sex, fame, influence, talent, happiness, pride, selfishness, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, whatever social media likes that you need to get affirmation. Anything that we find meaning in besides God are gods to us, and we serve and enslave ourselves to them. The way of life is relationship with and obedience to God. Anything else is the realm of death. This divide also kind of between sacred, sacred and secular is also influenced by our Christian understanding. I, I talk about this all the time, and I will, I will keep, I'll keep hammering this nail because I, I think it's important for us to get. But Christianity has become so much about how to incorporate God into our lives. Right? How do I fit God into my life? What more God things can I do to become a better Christian? We ask these questions as if life 
could be apart from God, the author, the creator, the sustainer of life. I think we're asking the wrong questions. It begins with God, and everything else we do flows out of that. Proverbs understands this and understands and it hinges upon this idea. Life begins with that submission, that obedience, that favor we find, that relationship with God. This is what determines your daily choices between life and death. Does this move me towards God or away from God? Everything we do can be asked that question. A lot of it is pretty minute. You know, what socks am I going to wear? Well, I don't think you can really move too far away from God by choosing the wrong socks. I don't know why I used that one. Moving on. <laughs> yeah, but this determines uh, whether we move, life or death is between whether we choose, this is moving towards God or away from God. The way of life, now I've got three, three more, uh, a lot of threes today. It's kind of the theme. The way of life, it begins with Jesus. It begins with Jesus. It becomes clear and it is fulfilled in him. Right, If way of life is this connection with God, this obedience and relationship with him, we realize that it is through Jesus that we have this connection. We can begin on this path and only on this path through Jesus. John 14, 6, Jesus says to him, said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no one can come into connection or relationship with God except through Jesus. Another way to say this is that Jesus is the true way of life to relationship with God. It begins with Jesus. He's the only way to leave this realm of death and begin on the journey for the way of life. If sin is not letting God be God, and it is serving anything other than God, then yes, sin puts you in this realm of death. And the only way we get out of death is by having our sin removed, killed, buried, so that we can have relationship with and obedience to God. This is what Jesus did. God the Son came down, became fully human, yet still fully divine, lived a perfect life and took upon himself sin, became sin, and died with it on the cross, buried it, and rose again, conquering both sin and death. By believing in Jesus as your Lord and Savior and accepting that his death, burial, and res resurrection cleanses you from sin and offers forgiveness from God. And this leads you into the way of life. If you're like, I've heard this before, good. You can hear it again so that you can present it to other people. I'm going to continue to tell you guys the gospel that way. It all begins with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, everything that we do can have eternal significance and purpose just by accepting the gift of salvation. Now that you've done that, if you've done that, you walk in this relationship and obedience to God. It's not a one-time prayer decision. It's more than that. It's a pathway. It's a way. It's a journey. We continue on that. Anything other than that path is to return towards the realm of death. And I'm not saying that you lose your salvation. I'm not going that far. But I am saying that if you're walking off the path of life, then you're walking away from what it really means to live. The life that God has prepared for you the life that God had saved you for, you're choosing to live outside of life and you're choosing to miss out. The way of life is rewarded. We don't serve God because of what he gives us, nor should we. we if you follow God because he makes your life better, then I'm going to kind of pre-warn you now, you're, you're going to be disappointed when things get hard because God is refining you to become more like Jesus. Things don't always get better in that sense. We don't follow him because of the benefits. We, serve, we don't serve God because of what he gives us. However, as with many of us who, not all of us, who have served God for a while, when you examine the product of your life by following God, you realize it's pretty awesome. Like, I didn't do it for the benefits, but dang, I got a lot, of, a lot of great stuff out of this. The quality of my life, personally, is more than I could ask for. I didn't plan any of what I do or what I've done or who I've married. I guess that'd be weird to plan that too far ahead. 
Do I want more money? Of course. Do I want more stuff? Yeah, sure. Would I like another vacation? Absolutely. And that's why we're doing another offering after this. That wasn't a joke. I'm kidding. That's, that'd be terrible. So bad. I didn't follow God for these blessings and benefits, and nor should you. Yet, don't you find it interesting that when you follow the author and giver and sustainer of life, life finds you? Interesting. John 10, 10. Thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. I came that you may have life and have it abundantly. The Westminster Catechism states that the chief end of man, the question is like, what's the main purpose of humanity? The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Pastor and theologian Dr. John Piper prefers to see this a little bit differently. He says uh, that the chief end of man is to glorify God by enjoying him forever. And I think he's onto something. I, I mean, you know, pastor, theologian, Dr. Piper. Yeah, I think he's got an idea. Uh, Christianity is more than just, well, by enjoying God. Christianity should be more than existing. And it should be the most exciting, fulfilling life that is out there. It's like we believe it, we want it to be true, but what's our, what's our experience? You ask yourself, if I am on the way of life, and I've been on this way of life for a while, why am I bored to death? Have you ever thought of that? Like, man, I kind of, anyways, maybe don't raise your hand. But I think if you're not enjoying God, then you're not doing this Christian thing right. If you're not happy or having fun, I think you're doing something wrong. Boring Christianity should be illegal. Not that I can enforce it, but... I'm not saying every moment you live as a Christian should be filled with overwhelming levels of fun, I guess. Unless you're Justin Santon. His whole life is fun. Just watch that guy. Nor am I saying we need to pretend we're having fun. You know, oh, I just love waking up at four in the morning and praying until, until I can't anymore. Like, we don't pretend. Don't, you need to pretend that we have fun when, you know, we secretly want to do all the things that we can't do now because we're good Christians. You know, I, Christians are known for, I don't do this, I don't watch this. I mean, that's, not saying that we, we should go and sin so you're more exciting. <laughs> I'm saying that the Christian life can be so fulfilling and fun in righteous ways and that we should seek that. Boring Christianity should not be a thing. We should be some of the most exuberant, joyful, excited people out there that don't need to do certain things and still really enjoy life. I've heard some believers... Um, talk about how some of the best people they know are non-Christians. Right, mostly posting that on social media. But they talk about how, like, oh, some of my favorite people are the best people I know that are non-Christians. And it's the Christians that tend to bother them the most. And this makes me wonder about two things. First, it makes me wonder about what their community around them looks like. Actually, no, sorry, that's the second thing. First, it makes me wonder about what they think following Jesus is supposed to look like. You know, when all of a sudden, all of your secular friends seem to be the ideal picture of living an enjoyable life. It makes me think, what do you expect the Christian life to be? Because I'm having a lot of fun, and I, I don't know why you think it shouldn't be. And the other thing is, I wonder what their community is like. And directly, I'm kind of asking, what is this community like? Maybe the Christians are too hypocritical. I think that's a problem that we have at times. Maybe they're too uptight. Maybe they're just boring. Right? I, some of us, and by me saying some of us, I'm saying generic us, and I'm not thinking of anybody in person, like for anyone personally, like just, I'm not even looking at any of you, but some of us are way too boring, are way, are way too boring to, glo I can't, can't do this, are way too boring to glorify God. Right? Father, forgive me for I am lame, right? I, there's a, there's a story in the Bible, I, I, I'm going to do this, this is probably bad, yeah, so John 3, 1 through 6, this is, this is terrible, the longest portion of scripture that I put up on the PowerPoint is for a joke that I'm making, and I don't know if that's wrong, I don't know if I want to be right, but anyway, so, 
uh, this story that we, we find in John where Peter and John go to pray and they see a man who has been lame from birth and they say, hey, rise up and get up and walk. I, I do this thing in my mind when I read this story. I make it extra fun. This is not the Bible. This is just me trying to be silly. But I read it as Peter and John and they encounter a man who's been lame since birth and so they're like, hey, rise up and rock, you know? Because <laughs> he's, he's lame. Like he's, anyways... But don't, whatever. So that's how I, that's, that's anyways. You guys enjoyed that a lot less than I expected. Following Jesus, walking is, is walking this way of life. It should be full of excitement. It should be incredible, full of life-giving qualities. I don't like alternative versions of food. That seems weird. I was talking with Gary and Khan about this, but like, Something that I think is an abomination to this world is uh, things like veggie burgers, yes. right? I, I don't mean to hate on this. I know we just talked, but like, but like zucchini lasagna or like zucchini noodles, which I eat those things. I do. It's good for me. But I'm not a big fan of those things because it doesn't matter how good they are. I don't care if the Impossible Burger fools everybody else. It doesn't fool me. It can be really, really good. It really can. But all I can think about is how good the original is, right? It might taste like meat, look like meat, smell like meat. But if blood was not shed, it ain't meat. You know, like I needed, I need sacrifices made for my burgers. No, I, like I'm not a fan of those alternative versions of like trying to make something that you want, but because you can't eat something. I, I mean, it's great if you do. I just personally really struggle with that. And I would prefer to just make a new dish, find a new recipe that, create, that puts the ingredients that I want in it and doesn't remind me of what I'm missing out. We follow the creator of the universe on this way of life. We can be more creative with how we righteously enjoy life with God and with each other. I'm always trying to copy them. I'm always trying to do what they're doing, but Christianize it. I mean, some of that's okay, but I think we... We serve the creator who made everything. We have this creative quality to us. Life can be so much fun. It doesn't have to be about, oh, we can't do what they're doing. It's look what we get to do. Say no to Christian veggie burgers. Don't do it, guys. Grumpy Christians are the worst. That should be a point. It's not a point. I just, want, I just wanted to say it. Like, if that's what following Jesus looks like, then I, it's like I probably want out, right? When I'm an old fart, I want to be like, not all there, but really funny, <laughs> you know? Like, grumpy Christians are the worst. If the product of following the way of life is being Mr. Grumpy Pants, then like, what, why are we on this? It should be exciting. Stop, stop being so, not, not you personally, but I'll let you judge that one. Stop being so boring. Find the excitement and the freedom of following Jesus. Okay, so here's a story about me, uh, which as all of them have been so far. Uh, <laughs> we, we were out camping with the young adults recently, and we were all sitting on the campsite. It was a group site, and we were having a lot of fun. And all the, um, all the young adults, I think they were playing like cards and like spike ball and whatnot, and uh, just being the heathens that they are. Um, and I'm sitting there, and it's good. I, I really enjoy camping. I love outdoors, I like being there. But I turned to my wife, because I'm bored, and I said, I was like, I just want to talk theology. Right? Like, I want someone to ask, like, I don't want to start it, because that feels weird. Hey, theology, right? Like, I, wa I, wanted, I wanted someone to ask me a Bible question, not because I'm spiritual, it's just because I'm a nerd, right? Like, I love that kind of stuff. I, like, and I was, just, I was just like, that's what I want to do right now. We're all here having fun, having a good time. It's like, I really want to talk about the Bible. It's kind of weird, but that's what I want to do. What I'm saying is that, that, that our, our lives should be so interwoven. I mean, you don't have to do this. That doesn't make you more spiritual. But our lives should be so interwoven with God that it's, such, it's a part of what excites us. It's a part of what brings us joy and fun. Like, I love those types of conversations. I love bringing those into whatever sort of relationships that we have. It's the part that excites me the most. All of my closest friends and favorite people are believers. 
I find the most joy and satisfaction in doing life with people when we have that common core value. That's, that's what the, honestly, those are the people who I have the most fun with. We don't even have to even talk about God, but just having that as a part of what we do, because it's just inescapable, it's just fun, it's just better. In Christ, we have that freedom of passion. Proverbs is not telling us to stop doing all the fun things so you could be a good, uh, I, I said Yahwist, because in Proverbs, they, they're not Christians then. It's like way older before Christ, so they'd be like Yahwists. But it's not saying don't, don't have fun. It's saying this is where you find life. This is what it means to live. It's more than living your best life. This is what it means to be alive. It is that relationship with and obedience to God. And lastly, life comes with the promise of eternal life. John 3, 16. Not only through 17 either because we always forget 17. And 17 deserves some credit. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. When we believe in Jesus in the death, burial, and resurrection, we accept him as our Lord and Savior, and we believe and are accepting this promise of eternal life, that one day God will return to establish this new heavens and new earth, and all the dead will be raised, and those who believe in him will get to live together with him on this new heaven and new earth. We get to live with eternity in mind, and oftentimes we live absent of that. To us, this means that death is not the end. Things like chasing longevity or immortality is over. Life is found in the letting go. I'm not saying go and take unnecessary risks, right? I'm not saying go be dangerous and dumb. Drink your water, eat your veggies, exercise, do all those things. Yet the purpose is not to prolong life. It's not a wrong thing. But that's not the purpose. We already have the promise of eternity. Why are you trying to stretch this out? You're missing out on the wildlife that God has for us if you're focused too much on preserving and prolonging it. We have the freedom to get a little wild for God. And this is kind of a great Sunday to bring this up because we've got students in youth camp. We've got folks in Cuba got people in Canada doing things, right? Like the things that you can do for God, if you're not worried about prolonging your life, you're willing to be a little bit risky, a little bit wild. You know, maybe you pick a career that doesn't make any money, and then you marry someone who also doesn't make money. I don't know who did that. Sounds stupid. But I'm having a good time. We have the freedom to get wild. Maybe it's, you know, saving money, budgeting, it's all very good. Talk to Jack about it. Save money. But maybe put some in for missions or some other things or go on a mission trip. Maybe spend a little bit more time with the church community because, well, okay, time is money and we've got a lot of important things to do. I don't know. Maybe get a little crazy. Show up on Sunday. You know, like <laughs> invite other people into your life and let them see Jesus in you. Get a little wild. Have a little fun, right? Whatever it is, we have this freedom to be a little wild for God. When we're not seeking to preserve our life, we get to go and live it. That's what Jesus gives us. Proverbs challenges us to reorient our understanding of life. It's not about what we have, but who we get. Material possessions, physical health, wonderful relationships, great things. And they're all lacking without the God factor. The way of life is relationship with and obedience to God. Anything else is the realm of death. From there, from that relationship with God, everything is fully enjoyed the way that God meant it to be. Let's have the uh, worship team come up. I totally thought I was going to get you guys out early. I say that every time, and every time I'm wrong. I even cut out one of my jokes for you guys just to... It's okay. I was making fun of Thomas, and I, it's being recorded, so I'm afraid. <laughs> Let's do this. Why don't we stand? There's, there's two groups of people I want to pray for right now. 
After talking about the way of life and how Jesus offers it to us, it would be wrong to not offer that opportunity. Even though I look around and, eh, I shouldn't say that, but <laughs> if anyone has never accepted Christ, and you want to start on that journey on the way of life. That's the first group I want to pray for. Um, so why don't we, everyone bow your heads, close your eyes. If there is anyone here that says, hey, you know what, today I want to make that decision. I never have, or I never fully understood it, but you know what, I want to believe in Jesus, who he is, what he's done for me, and I want to start walking on that path of, of life. Can you just wave at me real quick if there's anyone here? The second group I want to pray for is you feel like you've been on this way of life, but you wonder why you're bored to death. I think this life is, should be fun. I think with God, it is so much fun. It is so exciting. There's so many things we get. The peace, well-being, the emotional stability, the community relationship with God. If you're like, hey, you know what? Like, just being honest, like this Christian life isn't always as, as, as really as fun as I, I want it to be. Maybe your expectations are off. I don't know. But I want to pray for you because I want us to be joyful, excited people. <laughs> and so if that's you, and just give me a wave. Say, hey, you know what? This Christianity thing, I, I think there's more. And I, 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 there is, there is. I saw a few hands. You don't have to wave at me. All I needed was one hand so I can start praying. But if that's you, hey, just receive this prayer to you, to yourself. Heavenly Father, we love you because you first loved us and you've called us into this life, this journey, this path with you. And we know that at times it can be hard and that there are things that you've asked us to do, but there's also this amazing joy and excitement and thrill that you offer. Lord, help us to see it. Help us to find it. Help us to pull it out of one another. Help us to be creative with how we live righteously, how we love, how we live in a wild way that shows our, our freedom in you. Not covered by sin, but God, by the life that you offer us. Let's be people that laugh more sing more. God, fill us with that joy. Let us find all the goodness that you have for us in this world as we are on this path and as we continue to serve you and follow you and give all that we have for you. Lord, let us find that life. We don't want to be boring people. Jesus' name.